So glad that you all are here today. I'm Ann Rye. I'm head of middle school, and we are so delighted um, to have Bunny Hill share her wisdom with you today. You're in for a treat. Um, before introductions, just a few housekeeping items. Um, please enjoy some coffee up here. Bathrooms are um, to the back of the black box right before you go into the gyms. And we are going to have a fire drill <laughs> right in the middle of all of this. Um, at, around, <laughs> at around 9.20, we have permission to stay so we don't have to get up and clear. So hopefully it won't go too long. So we'll have a stretch break in the middle. So don't be alarmed <laughs> if we have a, a little, little drill in the middle of this. Um, and I would like to introduce you to Joan Moore, who will introduce our, and she is our Director of Advancement, who will introduce Bunny. Thank you, Dr. Rye. As Ann said, I'm Joan Moore. I'm the Director of Advancement here at Collegiate. And I am so honored to introduce our speaker this morning because I have known her for most of my life. And my kids and I have benefited from her wisdom, her expertise, and her love for children. For those of you that don't know, I am a collegiate lifer. I started in kindergarten here in 1971 and graduated in 1984. And Bunny started teaching me in sixth grade. In 1977, our middle school was not structured with teaching teams like it is today. So there was one homeroom teacher for fifth grade and sixth grades. But Bunny loved the class of 1984 so much that she actually moved up with our class each grade and taught us English. So I had her for seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, and tenth grade. And when we were in upper school, she was also our dean of students. Then she went on to be the head of upper school, the head of middle school, and finally assistant headmaster when she retired uh, here from collegiate five years ago. I have been truly blessed to be one of Bunny's students, one of her mentees, one of her colleagues when I started working here seven years ago, and always my friend and guiding light. For those of you that don't know, Bunny's first name is actually Harriet, um, but she was born on an Easter morning, and she's been Bunny ever since. So our Bunny Hill Quad is named after her because just like the beautiful space on our campus, Bunny is the heart and soul of Collegiate. Her 42 years of teaching at Collegiate are an invaluable resource to our families and faculty. And I cannot tell you how pleased we are that she's agreed to give a series of talks about students in middle school, arguably the most challenging time of our lives as parents. There are so many things to navigate, so many mistakes that can be made, but lots of challenges also lead to lots of opportunities. And that is what Bunny is here to discuss this morning. So with no further blabbing, and my glass is steaming up here, um, I'm thrilled to introduce my teacher, my mentor, my colleague, my lifelong friend and trusted advisor, and a new collegiate grandparent to preschooler Lincoln, Mrs. Bunny Hill. Well, I think we can all go home after that. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, it is really, really fun to be back. It's, um, this is home to me, and I uh, spent most of my life right on this, in, on this campus. But in this room in particular, a lot of really interesting things have happened to me over the years. And I was thinking about that when I walked in this morning. Um, I remember, for instance, my husband and I raised three children, and they all spent their lives in this, this neighborhood of collegiate. Um, but uh, my daughter was involved in the fourth grade talent show one year. And she uh, was doing a dance with two other friends, and she had choreographed it. And they had been at our house working, and I was aware of that. I don't know that I actually watched them, but I knew they were there doing something with music. <clears throat> so I ran over here just in time for her act. I was standing back in that corner. <clears throat> and as I came in, some people waved at me and recognized that I was there. The stage goes dark, the music starts, these girls come out on stage and they start doing this really interesting, beautifully choreographed dance. And I'm standing there thinking, wow, this is so good. She did such a good job and this is a really talented child. And, and uh, how wise of me to not get involved and just let them do it and get, you know, get on with their work. And just about that time, the, 
music swells up and the lyrics waft out over the crowd and, and the lyrics are and every and the lyrics are making love on the 50 yard line <laughs> and every adult in the room turned their head to look at me <laughs> as if you know choreographed itself and um, I just smiled like oh it's okay you know <laughs> uh, and then as I was walking back to my office across campus, the thought that was in my head is, you know, Bunny, you really ought to pay more attention to what's <laughs> going on with your kids. Uh, well, that's what this book um, is, at, is shouting at us to do. It is shouting at us as parents and people involved in the lives of children to pay some more attention, a little closer attention to what is going on. That's actually, I think, what a definition of parenting is, you know, we have some highlights and then there are these, whoops, <laughs> okay, we'll regroup. And then there's something else that seems pretty good and everything's all right and then it's, oh no, and then we regroup and we do that over and over and over again because every day our children are changing. And every day the world is changing. And there's no way that we get to a place where, okay, we've got this down and it's good now. That's not how it works. Unless, of course, you become a grandparent. And then none of that even matters. You just love the kids. It all's well. It doesn't really uh, affect us in the same way at that point or affect me in the same way at that point. Um, this topic... Is, is a serious topic, and so I, I like to make my presentations a little more entertaining than I feel like this one is. I don't mean for this to be a real downer, but the topic's a serious one. It's a, a fascinating information that I want to share, and it's almost a book report. Um, I am sharing things that I found to be important or that I found to, to be kind of aha moments, really, really significant that I hadn't thought of before kind of moments. But it, it's really about this book. And the book is, uh, in case you want to get it, look for red. It's Jean Twinji's iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, Less Happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. And then down here it says, and what that means for the rest of us. Um, this book is full of these graphs. Every page has a graph or a chart. Um, and so the, the data that I'm going to share with you today is all shown not just in text but visually. So it's an easy book to just refer to and leaf through. The handout that I gave you, which you don't have to read along with, but if you the numbers seem to just be rolling off and you want to. It's there. But wherever there's a parenthesis with a page number in it, it means that information came from that page, most likely on a charter graph. And, and those um, visual representations of the data are fascinating because what they show is over and over and over, they show these lines that kind of go along pretty consistently and then about 205, 206, 211, just dive down or just go soar high. Uh, it, and this data, this data comes from a period from 1966 to 2016. Um, she used four very highly respected and very intensive uh, surveys that have been, used, have, have been going on for a long, long time. Um, 11 million children are represented. Their responses are represented in these particular um, uh, four surveys, <laughs> historical surveys. And the questions were asked of children at the same ages, the same questions over all this time. So when she's looking at comparing across generations, she's comparing real responses from real kids at the same ages over time. <clears throat> the surveys, because of um, the high quality of these surveys, from the get-go, they were representative of the U.S. population. So demographically, they cover, they cover all groups. So gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic groups, location, um, all of those thing, peoples are represented in these surveys and have been from the beginning. 
uh, which adds to their validity. And certainly when we get to this generation of young people, it becomes even more important to, to make sure of because this generation um, is the most diverse generation in American history. Um, we're within a couple years of the non-Hispanic white population being 50% or below uh, for the first time that that has happened. So it's very important to, if we're talking about a change in culture and a change in the way young people live in the world that we have them in, then that has to be uh, taken into account. We have to make sure that the information is about all of us. It's not just about certain ones of us. That is what this, this does. I put um, uh, the titles of the, um, the four generations that are still pretty much alive and, and walking around because there are some references uh, to these generations, and I wanted to talk just a little bit about them. So the oldest generation, there, there still are some of the greatest generation people around, but the oldest generation that still um, uh, has the most people alive and all that is the baby boomer generation. Um, that would be, I, I'm one of those. And that goes from 1946 to 1964. Most of you aren't one of those. Um, the next generation, baby boomers, uh, the ones that followed were Gen X. And I put something incorrectly here. What should go beside Gen X is, is these words long adolescence. I'm going to talk about those in a middle bit. Really, long adolescence was a characteristic of the Gen X group and early, early millennials. So when I talk about long adolescence, I know that that's some of you, uh, but not, not most of you. That's 1965 to 1979. The famous group that we've heard so much about because they are the emerging adults and will soon be the largest group of Americans. Um, those are the millennials and their birth years are 1980 to 1994. Some of what we say about iGen affects those oldest millennials as well. You would see if you are one or have one of those close to you, you'd see some of the same behaviors in, in them. Um, and then iGen, which is how uh, Twenji describes and what, how she names the group of kids that are in school now, were born between 1995 and 2012. So everybody who's a teenager at, uh, right now is one of those, these people, an iGen person. It's an interesting coincidence that 1995 is the birth of the Internet. And... Um, much has happened uh, in, uh, in the technolo technological world since then. 24% um, of the uh, population are um, iGen uh, children and teenagers. It's, as I said, the most diverse group. But what's interesting from a teaching, parenting, psychological, sociological, maybe a historical frame of reference is the way they're growing up has changed so much, and that is so unusual. You would think every one of these new generations represented a brand new way to be children, but that wasn't true, really. When we look at all this data and compare these thousands of questions and look at, you know, pretty much things stayed, wobble a little here or there, but it was pretty much the same effect to grow up in America in these other generations. And then it changed. It changed for iGen. And one way that we can describe the change is they went from, kids went from requiring a long time in adolescence to get the adult responsibilities and, and tasks figured out to having no adolescence, to extending childhood and not even attempting the adult responsibilities and tasks that need to be figured out to become an adult. Slow childhood is the, the way that that is, is being named in a life theory um, way. So long adolescence looked like this. I talked about long adolescence here on this campus for 20 years because uh, it worried me so much that people were staying teenagers from age 12 to 25. That's how long it took to become independent and to uh, walk away from mom and dad. 
uh, economically, emotionally, in, in just about every way. That's a long time to be a teenager. It's a long time to have a teenager if you're a parent. <laughs> if you have three kids like we did that are spaced way out, you've got 30 years with a teenager in the house, you know what I mean. I would have longed for some slow childhood that we didn't get. But slow childhood, on the other hand, is kids in high school are acting like children. Not because they're acting immaturely, but because they aren't interested in assuming the mantle of adulthood. They're not pushing their parents away. They're not um, demanding the chance to be on their own, to leave the house, to be with their friends, to drive the car, to do this, to do that, to have a job. To, uh, they're pretty content to be at home. And they seem to be very content to be with mom and dad, and especially with mom and with dad, too. And we'll talk a lot more about that now. Uh, I want to say something about culture. Culture isn't something anyone can leave this room and change. We aren't in charge of it. It's the sea we swim in. There's no one person in charge of it, and there's no uh, movement. Uh, that we're going to create in our discussion today that's going to switch the culture. There will be strands of every part of human interaction and endeavor that go together to make culture. And, and it does change. Perhaps it's more like a river than a sea. But it doesn't change because I say so. Or it doesn't change because you say so. Now, what we do is, for ourselves and now parents and grandparents is... We have to figure out how we want to swim in that water and how we want our kids to. We have to figure out how we're going to be there in this culture. Um, culture doesn't really, um, it's not really good or bad. I mean, we can find good things about it. We can find bad things about it. But it's not really a good or bad thing. It just is a thing. Um, so some of our, um, some of the tirades that I might go on today aren't because I'm saying, okay, we're going to take our placards and get this all fixed. They're just, they're just a reaction to, if it's hurting our kids, it makes me mad. But I don't think culture's something that we can manipulate too much. Uh, before we really talk in depth about iGen, I want to talk about um, my experience growing up for just a minute to give a frame of reference to what I think happens. The baby boomers were all born to parents who were survivors of the Great Depression and World War II. These parents had a very clear idea of what mattered to them, and it was that they raised their children to be tough and strong because they knew full well the worst that could happen and how long it would be that way. And so they wanted their kids to have that kind of resilience that they, too, could survive the hard things that would come. No other generation from the boomers to today has that frame of reference. And it, you could find pockets of that, uh, but no, it's, it's not like everybody in town lived through that. And so they all agree on how we're going to raise these kids. Baby boom kids. Our parents weren't worried about safety. They knew what real trouble was. They knew what happened. They knew how people got killed and wars got started and people starved to death and people didn't have jobs. They, they knew all that. They weren't worried about what happened down the street. For instance, four, four houses from me, <clears throat> there was a German shepherd who had been a, a dog, in a World War II dog. He was a mean dog. He was old, too. <laughs> But he was a mean dog, and his master always had him in the front yard. There was no fence, no chain. And this dog would lay on the, on the grass, but his chin would be resting on the sidewalk, and there he was. If you went by that dog, he bit you. Now, none of us would allow that to happen. There are places to call and people to get to, get to and if the neighbor wouldn't cooperate, we would know what to do next. Or if you were my mother-in-law, somebody would steal him, and that'd be that. Um, <laughs> which is true story. Um, but what our parents thought about that dog was: if you don't want to get bitten, don't go by him. 
You know, don't you have a brain in your head? Don't you have legs? You know, go another way. Go across the street. Walk a little further out. What, what's wrong with you? Why are you complaining about Harry's dog? Was kind of the attitude, and it, it couldn't be more different than our attitudes with children are today. And so as we talk about iGen as a generation, we have to think about what, what has happened, what has been the impetus that has, has brought people into parenthood with such fear and who value safety so highly that that's the kind of the core value that underpins all else. And, and how does that play into who the iGen kids are and why they want to come home and be in the house and be with mom? Um, so what is slow childhood? Well, in, the book goes into great, uh, great, to great lengths by using some of these questions in the, in the database to tell us how kids are different today. None of these may apply to yours. I mean, this is the this is the group, the average kids. And so, in, in in the answers to these thousands of questions, there are some kids who answered way out here, and some kids who answered here, but most of them answer here, and that's where you get this kind of um, of thought. Also, it may not ring true for your kid yet, uh, or or it may. But, it, but they're with other children, and they're living in a child, a teenage world, where it's true of the average kid there. So, I, Gen Kids, go out less without their parents. So, 12th graders in 2015 go out less than 8th graders did in 2009. So, in six years, 18-year-olds are now doing what 14-year-olds used to do on Friday nights, you know, during, during their social life. That's a very fast change for that to happen. And nothing like what their parents did. That's not all that unusual. Uh, because the parents have been programmed to keep some of that from happening. iGen teens are less likely to date. Well, that's not real surprising because they're less likely to go out with their friends, too. But they're definitely less likely to date. Um, and then the, there's all kinds of ramifications for that that I didn't list here that are think, kind of things that I would talk about more in All About Boys or All About Girls. But the, the um, significance and statistical significance uh, that leads from that is, explains why they're sexually less active and why the teen birth rate is half of what it was in the 90s. Again, across all demographics. Um, one out of four iGen teens do not have a driver's license when they graduate from high school. This absolutely floors me. I had 395 people in my senior class, and there was one who didn't have a driver's license, and that was because she gassed the car instead of braked it and headed right into the motor vehicle place, and they didn't want to give her a license. But, <laughs> uh, it's 20% down from the boomers. And what's so fascinating about that, this isn't city kids. The biggest group of these kids are suburban kids. But again, it's the statisticals through all groups, all economic groups and all location groups. What's so fascinating is a driver's license has traditionally been, for, since Henry Ford, traditionally been the license to leave home, to get out of the house, to... Um, be free. To, once you get away from your parents in that car, you can go where you want, with whom you want, do what you want. Uh, it's kind of a, always has been kind of a status symbol to be able to drive. Uh, kids have wanted to do that. But one out of four is a pretty significant uh, statistic for high school seniors. And these are kids who are leaving home now. So that means that when they leave home, they won't be able to drive in the next thing that happens to get to other places in the next thing that happens. Um, and, and they don't seem to be at all embarrassed about being chauffeured by mom and dad. And by the way, that's spelled wrong. Um, which, again, teenagers as recently as six or eight years ago would be saying, I don't want to be driven by my mom to school. You know, what are you talking about? 
Nobody else in Bob's picking him up after school. That's not the case today. And that's a shift. That's a cultural shift. And it means something. Um, in the 80s and 90s, there was this um, group of people who became the latchkey kids, were the kids whose moms had gone back to work or dad, both parents were working. And they were too old, really, to go to the babysitters, so they went home and had an hour or two at home alone. These were kids that were old enough to do this. Um, kids don't do that now. Teenagers are not at home without their parents much these days. I can remember as a teenager, and I know my kids could remember this, coming home to an empty house and thinking, oh, thank God. <laughs> Nobody's going to make me do anything. I can do exactly what I want to do. Uh, but evidently, the lure of that isn't very strong these days. Um, another change. Less teenagers are working part-time jobs. So throughout time, and, and this, would, this is everybody's kids, again, socioeconomic, going to college or not. But over time, high school kids have worked. Have, they've worked part-time. It is not an unusual thing to do that, to get their spending money, or because they want a car, or because they want to drive and they have to buy their gas, or because they want more clothes than mom will buy, or whatever it is, save for college, whatever it is, kids have had part-time jobs. In 1970, 78% of high school seniors had worked in some way and had money of their own. In 2010, 30% of the high school seniors have had a part-time job and earned money. Uh, one, of the, one of the boys who was interviewed um, it, it, as Twenji was writing the book about this point said, well, I've never learned how to earn. And he was talking about money, but I've never learned how to earn. It's about more than just money. The other interesting, and this time that they might have been, that they might have spent working, some people say, well, you know, that's because they've got to do their homework. There's so much homework. Well, the one thing that hasn't changed since 1966, the one thing that has a straight line is the amount of time kids spend on homework that they report spending on homework. That hasn't changed. Kids aren't studying more because they're not having part-time jobs. Um, and they're not going to more extracurriculars. Um, in addition to not earning their own money, spending money or whatever money, iGen teens are mo more likely to not receive an allowance from their parents. Um, so if they want something, or need something or whatever, they just go, they go to mom. I want it, I need it, will you get it for me? And mom gives them the money. What that means is they aren't managing any money. They will go to college without ever having to think about, okay, well, I can't drive all the way there and back without filling the car up with gas at 259 cents a gallon and I'm 14 gallons. But they haven't done that. And then they're going, whatever they do next, that's an adult responsibility that had to be learned, that isn't getting learned. Um, so if you have an 18-year-old child who has no money in his pocket or her pocket, and whenever she wants to do anything or he wants to do anything, they have to come begging for money, which isn't really begging because they're going to get it. In my experience, that's what's going to happen. Um, that would be like a 12-year-old from the past. That's what slow childhood means. All of these things are what slow childhood means. If you have a 16, 17, 18-year-old who has you driving them wherever they want to go, that's slow childhood. That didn't used to happen then. That was what you did with 10, 11, 12, 13, maybe 14. Hopefully by the time they were 15, Big Brother could take them to school. I mean, there was a point there that... Um, slow childhood means practicing these things isn't happening. Um, now, there's a lot of things that are kind of cool that have come because of slow childhood. Obviously, they're not having sex as much as they're not going out. They're not drinking as much. That's a huge one. There's been this huge drop in the age kids experiment with alcohol. In fact, 40% of seniors have never tried alcohol 
in this group. And that is unusual. There have been years where it was 90% had, you know, at least had a sip, you know, had, and had had drink and had gone to a party. Um, the number of eighth graders who tried alcohol has been cut in half. Uh, more kids are waiting until they go to college to drink. Now, when they get there, the drinking in college is binge drinking. But even then, less of them are engaging in that than did before. So that's been cut in half uh, from the 1980s to the present time. This is good news. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this. And, and a lot of this, these, these things come back to safety. These kids have believed they need to put their seatbelts on. They will not get in the car with somebody who's been drinking. They will be really angry with you if you take out the cell phone when you're driving. Uh, they are afraid to drive around with friends who might get in a wreck. They don't get tickets. They don't speed. You know, they're not drinking. So the safety has improved because of this behavior in this area. That, then the improvement's a, a good thing. It's an example of their value and safety. Hygiene teens are not in much of a hurry to grow up. That's what this list is all about. Um, so so what, what's the slow part? How did we go from long adolescence, where they wanted to start doing these things at 12, but hadn't quite figured out how to do them by 25? What's the slow part? Well, what has slowed down is them assuming adult-like responsibilities and adult-like responsibilities being thrust upon them. The ones who didn't assume it before, the parents didn't care. They had to do it anyway. I, I, it, it, there was no question when I was growing up if we would do the chores, if I would take my sister to school, and my parents both had uh, terrible illnesses in my teenage years. So there was no question who was going to clean the house, cook the meals, do the air. I mean, no question at all. And I wouldn't have, A, thought to question it, and B, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. I was old enough. I knew how to do it. it my family needed me. I felt so good about myself for doing it. That confidence that you get when you assume these responsibilities, when you have these experiences, when you learn these things as you go along, it grows who you are on the inside. So you get ready for adulthood not be, just because you can drive a car or because you can balance a checkbook or because you know you're going to have to go earn more money if you're going to spend more money. So you've got to make a decision. You know you're going to do that. Or you know you're going to, if you want to get that A, you're going to have to study more. You know it. So you get to decide to do it. And, and if you've been practicing it, then, okay, I can do it. I mean, that's the natural thing that happens. Um, so the assuming adult-like responsibilities has slowed way down. The growing um, through and enjoying the freedom and the independence that comes from assuming these responsibilities has slowed way down. The connecting more strongly to your peer group than your parents, almost gone. And more, connecting more strongly to other cool adults who aren't your parents, that's kind of slowed down, too, because you're best friends with your parents. So what's to rebel against? You know, who are we gaining independence from if we like the dependence part? <laughs> um, but what ha now, it's, it's not fun to have teenagers who don't listen to you. I can testify to this. Um, and, and I know thousands of other people who can, too. That's not fun, but it's kind of troubling to have an 18-year-old who's asking you to call him at college and wake him up for his classes, or who doesn't ask, but you do it because you know he won't get up. So, you know, he's got to go to class, right? Um, that's, a, that's slowed down. Another thing that has slowed down is when you stay in this sort of self-focused period of childhood. Uh, oh, by the way, let me back up for a minute. One of the ways slowed childhood happens this is natural, it, 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 this has happened before, is when people have fewer children and more time and interest in investing themselves in those children, then slow childhood happens. You know, I, uh, so in my baby boomer experience, 
Um, I did take piano lessons at college. But I, there were no organized teams, there were no activities, and you know, nothing that my parents said, you know, you really need to work on this, or you really need to work on that. Or when they said you really need to work is if a grade card came out and I didn't have a good grade. Now you really need to work on this. But they paid no attention. But we wouldn't do that today. We pay a lot of attention to our children. We're focused on them. And what they... Uh, what happens in the slow childhood is everything is focused on them. Now, one formula for unhappiness in life is to be self-focused. And one formula for happiness in life is to be other-focused. I, I mean, there's a lot of ways to say it and a lot of ways that Twenji will say it, but it comes down to that. If all you think about is yourself, you can find all kinds of reasons to be unhappy. You know, the hot chocolate is cold. You know, that could be a reason. Or it could be nothing, because nothing it is, right? Uh, so this slow childhood, what, what we see is there's, a, there's time to really grow an individual self, and we see iGen doing that. And there are in that really interesting things that I think may really prove good for the world. And there are really troubling things that for sure might make people unhappy, the, these same individuals unhappy. Um, <clears throat> the one thing about slow childhood that I'm puzzling over, and I don't really know the answer to this, I'm sure there's an evolutionary piece, so I don't think there's a, an immediate answer, but there's also a right now piece. We know that the brain grows through experience. It's the experiences that cause the neural pathways to connect and get stronger and go different places. And it's something you learn something, you do something, you experience something, boom, you get a brain. The prefrontal cortex of the brain, that's all of this massive brain right here, is the executive function of the brain. That's where you make decisions. That's where you say, he unfriended me. I'm going to post this hideous picture of him tonight on the, on, on the website, wherever I post it. And then you do it. You push the button, and then you think about it. It's sort of that ready, fire, aim. You do it, and then you think about it. When your prefrontal cortex is put together, you have a chance to do some thinking about it. Before it's there, you don't, have much of a, you don't get much help from your brain to do that. It has to take a lot of conscious effort. Or a parent. <laughs> they, they, kind of, they say about, they, we used to say about teenagers, <clears throat> from a brain standpoint, teenagers get the gas before they get the brakes. So the parents have to be the brakes for a while in here to keep them from hurting themselves and others along the way. Um, well, we know that this isn't completely formed till about age 25. And, um, and, and that's, that's how long it takes to have these experiences and do these things and, and make this, uh, this prefrontal cortex what it's supposed to be for us. If we're not having these experiences, this is what I'm wondering in slow childhood. Long adolescence, there was a lot of time to get that done. But in slow childhood, I'm wondering what those experiences are and what those activities are that kids are doing that, that, that is completing that process. Or is it going to be a different prefrontal cortex at 25 than it, it would have been with more active engagement in growing up? Uh, that's, uh, that, I'm curious about that. I don't actually know for sure what, what that will look like. Another uh, factor about slow childhood is um, I gen teenagers really like childhood. So there are questions on these surveys like, are you most likely to agree with? And then there'll be a statement. So the statement, the happiest time in my life is in life is when you're a child. iGens like that question a lot. They, they agree with that question. Or the, the, I would rather be an adult than a child owner. That one's not a popular one today. But that would have been re reversed even a generation ago. That would have been reversed if you look at the data from 2004. Um, so that's one of these changes. Um, 
And in an interview situation, when when uh, when she's talking to kids and she's talking about the responsibilities of adulthood and and the excitement of that, um, they say it doesn't really sound like fun to them. All that responsibility? Well, no, I don't. I don't want all that responsibility. In fact, you know this verb adulting, which is just a horrible word. That you know you don't get to vote on what words people use. Um, it's a, it's a verb, and it means things like doing laundry, paying bills, getting out of bed on time, going to work at 8 o'clock. This, this is what adulting is. This isn't you know, nuclear fission kinds of stuff. This is just doing the things we do to get up and get dressed in the morning. And it's a negative word. It's always used in a negative context. Ugh, I'm going to have to do some adulting today. It's not adultery, by the way. This is adulting. Uh, <laughs> So even so, now these kids, the eight, these 18-year-olds that we're talking about here, go to college. My goodness! I mean, first it's nothing, and now it's college. It's a dorm. It's fraternities and sororities. It's parties. It's it's what it's responsibilities. And not surprisingly, they take with them in their pockets this wonderful substitute for mom because it has her voice in it and they call her she she actually on her computer registers them for classes or, or um, calls them to wake them up knows when the deadlines are for knows what their homework is knows what classes they're in. I mean I, I I stay at this way because I I don't think my parents had ever thought to ask me when I had a paper due I mean, it wouldn't have been, they had more interesting things to talk about, for sure. Um, so it's like the sixth grader coming to school with iPhone in their pocket, too. Uh, they feel more safe, and the parent feels more safe, and they are 100% not more safe. First of all, they weren't in danger. There was nothing to be afraid of. So they come with the anxiety, and they come with the crutch, and then they are there at school. Now, yeah, uh, we all know why there's this. Like, what we know the outside real life reason for this anxiety. What we don't know is why we create that anxiety when this isn't happening today here. It's because we think it might, right? It's, it's because we're so worried that we are. Our thoughts are ruled by fear. Our actions then reflect that. Our children worry about being safe. And then they grow up in a bubble trying to make sure that they're safe. And there's, it's not hard to figure out the reasons it happens, us doing it or them feeling that way. But if we want to know why, to the iGen teens, are more anxiety, more depression, more unhappiness, let's start there. More anxiety, more depression, more stress, more suicide thoughts and more suicides. Twice as many suicides in this generation of children as in any other generation and the mo other most high. And girls too. Boys have usually been more successful at suicide. Girls, are, they are making it up. And th why is that happening? They're safe. They're well fed. They're loved. They have all the reasons that if you look at Maslow's chart, these needs have been filled and they have great promise. Why is it happening? That's what this book is. The why is this happening? What would explain it? More than the kids who grew up in the Depression? More than the kids who grew up post 9-11, whose parents are serving across seas in wars? Uh, so that's what the book is about. Now, in the past, when parents began to get a little pushy of, on teenagers, the, the uh, expected response was they push back. Maybe they rebel against that. They have this, this plotted DNA plot in their head. You better get away from these people if you're ever going to have your own life, your own family, your own home, your own job. To do that, these people have to go, right? But, uh, but iGen kids don't feel that way. 
they are very connected to home and family and parents, and they are not rebelling. Um, uh, are there, do some of you have rebellious teenagers? Yes. But a lot of us in the room don't. It's kind of a cocoon mentality. I, I, I won't have time to talk about a lot today, but I think it's very much worth thinking about if you're a parent, grandparent, teacher, or whatever you are. Um, <clears throat> so these kids who are in slow childhood and who, who value safety very highly and who really can you show, show that value in their everyday behaviors. Um, these kids have this sense that they are in danger when they're insulted or when they're hurt, certainly when they're bullied or when somebody disagrees with them vehemently. They, they don't, they're not curious, angry, insulted. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they don't respond in what you might, what you might respond in. They respond as if they've been hit, as if they, someone's got a weapon and it's, it's aimed at them. They're responding to all kinds of um, emotional kind of things as if there, it is danger in the same way that real danger is. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Um, so, so this whole movement, it, it's, it's not just that, that um, the, the kinds of things that we've always taught about learning how to be kind and learning how to share and learning how to uh, think about other people's needs and ideas and thoughts and religion and politics, all these things. But it's not about this kind of hug that says, I'm really interested in all the different things you all think. It's no threat to me what, what you think or what you, even what you say, even when you say it to me, because I can just say, you're wrong. I don't care what you say. Get away from me. You know, you're not nice. I mean, whatever it is. You, but when those things feel like arrows and when the anxiety that you have about associating with people uh, is, is like it would be if there was a real enemy there, then we get this situation that colleges are dealing with even more than regular schools, this kind of if a speaker comes on campus and you don't like what they stand for and what they say, that, that you have to have a safe room where there are counselors and coloring books to color in and, and kids to, who, who are also frightened by the fact that across campus in another room somebody's saying things you think you don't like. And, and I don't mean to make light of the serious issues of today. There's no question we have serious issues of today. But the fear of these ideas, the fear of people and their ideas and their beliefs, um, makes it very hard to know what to do about the fact that we're a diverse world and we have diverse thoughts and beliefs and ideas. And it's very hard for colleges because how do you teach when you have to warn the students in your class, in a college class, now there are some words here that might offend you. But let me explain this and before we get to the place where these words are, I'll let you know so that you can leave if you need to. It feels very uncollege-like. It feels very ungrowing the intellectual, un, uh, not, deeping, uh, not deeply diving into material. I mean, think about sociology classes, psychology classes, history classes, political uh, science, literature. Think about the ways that the multiple ideas of the world are explored that could be offensive and that you'd have to warn a student about. Um, oh, you would only have to do that because they really are pretty fragile emotionally. And they really haven't kind of uh, broadened out their, their way of dealing with ideas different from theirs. Now, a lot of people have it. We live in a world where we're having a lot of trouble dealing with other people's ideas. Uh, but um, these are the learners. These are the ones who don't even know what the ideas are yet and haven't heard them yet, who haven't been able to play with them yet. So, okay, that's slow childhood. Before we move from slow childhood to well, what is going on that has made this kind of a change, um, do you have any uh, questions or comments about that?
Okay, so what's going on? Um, what are they doing? You know, they're at home, uh, and they don't have more homework than they used to, and they're not going to jobs, so what are they doing? Well, uh, there's a lot of information about that in, in the book. So first of all, high school seniors in this generation spend six hours, uh, average, not yours maybe, six hours a day on screen time that is leisure. That does not mean my kid's got a computer, he's doing homework. That's not even included there. And, and frankly, that doesn't include, these tallies don't include TV unless they're streaming on their computer. So six hours a day is broken up into 2.5 hours texting, 2.2 on the Internet, 1.5 gaming, 0.5 video chat. And any given kid is six hours of social media or six hours of gaming. Or, I mean, so it depends. Six hours a day. Boys, men, in the ages of 20 to 25, 20 to 25% of them are not working. They are spending their days in the basement, usually mom and dad's basement, gaming. When we get to this place where we talk about college kids and, and, and young adults not dating, not, not uh, doing things that, that would lead to uh, having a couple or having a family or all that stuff, that's certainly one of the factors that would explain that. And that's the addicted group who didn't make it out of their teenage years um, with a sense of balance about this. Okay? Uh, eighth graders are very, very close, five hours a day. Uh, and um, this doesn't vary very much by group except to say that disadvantaged youth may spend a little more time. Everybody has iPhones. It is irregardless of socioeconomic status. I forget what that percent is, like 90% of American teenagers have an iPhone. Um, a smartphone, but usually iPhone. Um, before we, we go past this, I want to say something about this that really struck me from my parenting days. Uh, we had three, three children, and before that they were born, a friend of ours said, I, I think we said, boy, you've got nice kids. You know, what's your secret? <laughs> How did you do that? Uh, and the answer was, we keep them busy. We keep, there is no time to watch TV at our house. We might sit down together, but I mean, we keep them busy. So, so my husband and I had that in our heads. Here's the recipe for having good kids. Keep them busy. <laughs> Well, it turns out that's not the whole recipe, but, uh, but the way we looked at it, school ended at 3. And they were going to go to bed, depending on their age, anywhere from 8 to 10. That's a lot of hours. In fact, is it 6 or 7 hours? So if they have 2 hours of homework, that's 5 hours that could be spent on an iPhone. That could be spent watching TV. That could be, you know, spent doing something. But there are ways to spend it that are good. And by good, I mean we call them protective factors. There are activities kids can be involved in that create the, um, the soil for emotional stability and health. And there are activities that kids can be involved with that destroy it, that destroy emotional health and stability. So... The thinking about what is those ways to spend those hours, was that was important to us a long time ago, important to lots of parents. And so what our rule was, um, when you're done with tutorial or done with school, you either are in an organized sport or activity or you get a job. I, you've got chores at home. They take you, you know, a good 15 minutes, <laughs> maybe, it, it, the way you do it. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But there's something going on, and it has nothing to do with going home and doing nothing. Uh, and that, so these hours of the day, uh, there are other things that could be happening during these hours of the day. And these things could be happening too, clearly. So the reality of, of teenagers today is their life is lived online. And I really mean that. It's not like they have a life with friends and 
all this other stuff, a vibrant social life in this teenage world that they're living in and a social media life. This really kind of swung to a social media life. In fact, when, when Twenji said to uh, kids, um, what would happen if you just put your phone down for a, a week, one week? And their, their response was, was something like, well, it's all over. I would have no life, and by the time I got back, it would be too late. I'd be out of it. I'd be gone. I'd be, I'd be, you know, not, I wouldn't exist in this world. That is the only world I have. Um, so that's, that's this now. The, the, a lot of, a lot of adults are on Facebook and, and do, even do, you know, more modern things like use Twitter or whatever, but kids are always changing the platforms that they're on. But one thing is for sure. It's, a, it's not a, oh, let me just post this. It's a highly organized, very strategic, thought, well thought out process of how am I going to present myself? Because my goal is I want to be accepted. I want to be noticed. I want to have lots of friends. I uh, would love to have some positive comments. Uh, I've got to look good, uh, as, and, and it takes a, a lot of effort to make a post, to make a comment, to even, even post a picture. In fact, uh, uh, the girls talk about if this picture is going to be posted, I'm, it's one out of 50 of the pictures I take will work. I mean, I've, it, it, this is a process that requires a lot of attention on myself. A lot of attention on hoping that then when I put it out there, it doesn't bring any kind of um, negative feedback to me. Or worse, no feedback. This thing that I put on there has to be responded to. Um, one girl said, it was, uh, when she asked one sixth grade girl about this, and she um, she said, well, what do you mean? What, what kind of look are you going for? She said, well, you can't look sad. Of course, we know you can't look fat. You can't look ugly. You can't you know, have a new pimple. You can't show your braces. You, you take your glass. I mean, we know there's a lot of other things you can't be, too, but you can't look sad. Uh, the, the image, the online image is inauthentic. The online image is an image that's been created, just like the models in magazines, only our children are creating images of themselves. It's not who they are. The truth is, this time in life is about figuring out who you are. So in all fairness, they may not really know who they are. They know who they aren't. They aren't this perfect thing that fits, that they are actively working to create. Now, this happens in the hall at school, too. It always has. When my daughter was in seventh and eighth grade, she was out of bed at 4.30 in the morning, washing and blow drying her hair. I mean, I, I just shocked. I mean, this girl, you couldn't get her out of bed before that with dynamite. Um, by the time she got to high school, she was going to school in her pajamas if they'd let her. But, they, you know, when she was in seventh and eighth grade, it required a lot of effort to go out and face the world. Well, that effort is now this, goes into this online world. The presentation of an inauthentic self is one of the things that must be making childhood so slow because building an authentic self takes a lot of work. That's what these years are supposed to be about. It, it, it's, it's not, it, 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 this has shoved that out. You know, the, this is one of those things that has shoved that out. So um, if they're spending six hours a day in this way, by the way, and you know this if you, if you have teenagers of one gender or the other, um, girls are more on social, um, social media kinds of net social networking, social media. Uh, boys are more gaming. But, they, but now they both kind of bleed over into both worlds. But if, if this isn't sounding like your boy because he's not posting and he's playing games, that's not surprising. Games... Uh, gaming is with other people, uh, and other people aren't with you necessarily. I mean, it's nice when they are, but they aren't usually. So uh, that's a whole other kind of, of world, and that's why when you interrupt them, 
it's so hard to get them to drop the game and come do what it is you're asking because they're dropping the other people who are doing the game too. I mean, it's not like it's just, okay, I'll, do, I'll come back to this. I'll pause it. We I mean, can't pause it. You lose it, but you can't pause it. Um, what used to happen during these hours? Um, well, one thing that used to happen is kids used to read. And we're talking all kids. We're not talking, you know, me. I read, you know, the cereal box if nothing else was handy. Kids used to read one or two books a week. And that reading was one of those protective factors. And these were these were books that you couldn't that you, you know that that you actually turn, it's not the turning the pages that does it it's the staying in it it's the patience it's the following it's the, especially if you're reading something hard it's the thinking and then even, whether it's easy or hard then when you've read it then it's the dreaming the visioning the daydreaming the uh, well what's next the the whole thing about well this is how this book shows life. This is different than my life. This isn't my life anymore. In fact, I left my life for a while. I'm in this one. Um, so that took up uh, some time. As, as the 1970s, almost every teenager read a, a magazine a day and a book a week, or was reading a book every day. Uh, in 2015, that had gone to 16%. Now, what if they're reading on Kindle? They're for, we know they're reading or not reading for school, but they're supposed to be reading for school. But what if they're reading on uh, the computer or the phone or wherever? The way uh, a lot of kids read there is, is very selective. It's like a Reader's Digest thing. You know, you get the highlights. Oh, You know, it, it's, it's a very different kind of experience. But they, if they're reading a book a day on their Kindle, they're reading. But if they aren't reading, but they're doing something else on the electronic devices, they're not reading. And it's the reading that's important. Uh, in 1990, 70% read a newspaper. We're talking newspaper, not sports article. News, the whole thing. Uh, at, at least once a week, and 10% did in 2015. There aren't even a lot of newspapers in a house to read. So, I mean, that's, that's a little easier to imagine happening. But there was something about reading the newspaper that was important. That was important in building the mind. That was important in building the vocabulary. That was important in knowing what's going on in the world, not from the kind of posts that your friends who agree with you about everything in the world give you or send you, or not because you hate what somebody else has said, but because you're reading what the information is. So you have something to think about what you think about it. Right? Does that make any sense? Now, because the reading isn't being done like it was, that's probably something that was lost with this other time being spent, we see a huge change in academic skill set in just nine years. So when the SAT um, critical writing, or writing and critical reading dropped by 13 points in that short amount of time, that's because kids aren't reading, period. There's nothing else that accounts. That their, the scores dropped. The millennials have great SAT scores. Stable, the same. You know, the, there was no drop there. iGens look so different from the millennials that, that, that when you look on the page and the graph goes down, you think, whoa, what happened here? What happened here was they stopped reading. Um, in some of the studies, uh, they were monitoring what happens when uh, college kids are on their computers. Um, and what they, they would take a, a screenshot every second or something. What they found out was that the average college student whose computer was open on their desk um, switched tasks every 19 seconds, and 75% of the windows that were opened were stayed open less than a minute. Um, these are college students at their desks. <laughs> these aren't the seventh grade girl, you know, lying on her bed with her, with her smartphone. The implications, of, you can draw your own conclusions about that. Obviously, nobody's going very deep, very far, very long in their, um, in their leisure time thinking. Um, one of the really interesting things that kind of surprised me, and then, then on second thought it didn't, um, 
The most common videos that high school girls watch are cat videos. <laughs> and some of them report watching them for hours a day. And so when they're on that iPhone, it doesn't necessarily mean there's some pernicious activity, but high school girls? And they, they interviewed this one kid named Darnell, who I'm so fascinated by. He's 20 year old. And he says, sometimes I just spend the whole day looking at pictures of puppies. I mean, I don't even know anybody. I mean, I, I like those videos too, but I, wouldn't you get bored? I mean, it's just so, so here's how I would explain this. This is interesting. This is sociological data at its finest, right? These kids are stressed out. We know they're stressed out. This is absolutely, you know, the calm app. And it, it, it's very similar. Again, we're talking about high school kids. Dar Darnell is 20. It's very common for 12-year-olds to come to school looking like a teenager, in teenager garb, listening to teenager music and wanting to do teenager things, and go home and play with dolls. So we would expect in this bridge from childhood to adolescence, we would expect this kind of, which world do I live in? A these are 18 and 20-year-olds. They haven't crossed the bridge when they still are comforted by the, the stuffed animals. You know, when they're still comforted by the, the, um, the, the comfort toys of childhood, the comfort space of childhood, the comfort people of childhood. Uh, they're stressed. That's where the comfort is. They haven't moved on to where the comfort comes from. Their friends, their boyfriend or girlfriend, or whom, some significant person, the, their boss, you know, their favorite coach or teacher, their themselves. I mean, it, they haven't transferred uh, in order to get a sense of comfort somewhere else. Really, that's what our job is as parents: is to help help them be able to cross that bridge while they're still with us, so we can be there. <laughs> to watch that process. It's, it's hard to do that today. I don't know. I mean, I, the, clearly things have changed a lot. Um, in, in social lives, you don't have this on your handout. I realize that this is why I'd left this out. The social lives are four things that I think were interesting. iGen teams spend less time at parties than any previous generation. That's a lot of generations that, are, that have been you know, looked at. The number of teams who get together with friends has been cut in half in 15 years. Um, and there have been steeper declines in the most recent years. Um, college students in 2016 versus 1980 spent seven hours of in-person time socializing a week. That's an hour a day. Um, that's in college where you are surrounded by people your age, where it's almost difficult to find hours away from everybody else. But what that means is that seven hours less a week, getting to know other people, um, having face-to-face -face eye contact, learning to read these other people and to know what's going on, learning to read a group, learning to um, negotiate when you have different ideas about how to spend the time or what to do in the room, or college kids have trouble telling the roommate to make her boyfriend go home at night. Instead, they'd tell their mother, who calls the dean, who has to then interview the proctor, the two roommates, you know, the, and pretty soon the roommate that got turned in is mad and leaves, <laughs> which is great because then you have the room to yourself. <laughs> this, this, Deficit, this social skill deficit is such a dangerous thing. Uh, I, I did have a thought about that last night that let me uh, share. And I know that some of these things come in randomly, but these, this information jars me every once in a while. That, that really jars me. Of all the times in my life when I actually had uh, friends around me, it was college. I mean, to not spend hours a day playing cards, talking, you know, even studying together, planning the whatever we were going to do to party or go somewhere or do something. I mean, I still talk to those people, but I don't think these people are going to talk to anybody later. I mean, what, what are the bonds? Where's the connection? 
when, that doesn't happen. But my random thought was this. We know from first-hand reports and from books that have been written on the subject that sometimes people who are in a situation where they're alone and they are attacked by someone else, sometimes they report that before it happened, they didn't even know the assailant was there. The hair stood up on the back of their necks. The, 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 your, the body knew before the brain said it, run, you're in trouble. This intuition about whether a situation is okay or not, whether a person is safe or not, whether what you're doing right now is a, is a good thing to do or not, this intuition is the result of a lifetime of experience of knowing people, uh, of sensing when something's a little off, when that, when that charming guy with that smile is, you know, trying to get you in the car, that he's not a charming guy. You know, of knowing when to be afraid and when to not be afraid. That comes from social interaction and experience with human beings. And you, ha you already have that with your family, and you're safe there. Well, not everybody is, but... We hope you're safe there. But you don't have that with anybody else unless you go make it happen. And, and you, don't learn, you learn that on people you know so that when you're in situations with people that you don't know, you have enough of a reservoir of things clicking off that you have a sense of what to do. So you can be safe, whether you have a weapon or an iPhone or not. You can be safe because you can rely on yourself to look at that. This is what childhood is supposed to be about, is learning how to be human, learning how to live in this world. Um, and, um, and that requires being in it, not being online in it. That's okay, but that's not where you learn it. It requires being in it. Um, you got to be with people. So these social skills go also to when you become friends. Friendship is practice for... Friendship is friendship. In and of itself, it's a wonderful thing. And friendship, friends can be um, best friends, intimate friends, can be friends. Uh, it is the fact that you share secrets and that you share sad things and that you share your life with them, that their friendship is really deep with you. But it's, it's practice for the next interaction, which would be family making, you know, coupling, family making, parenting, uh, that kind of relationship which goes deeper. But how do you decide to live with someone for the rest of your life or parent children for the rest of your life if you can't even have a friend? If you haven't even learned how to get along with somebody well enough to know them well enough, to want to be with them enough, how do you choose someone to stay with forever? Well, it, it, clearly it's hard. The iGen kids, 30% of them were raised in single-parent houses. They um, uh, are showing little interest in, uh, in, in romantic relationships, in college even. They're not dating in high school. They're not really doing them. I mean, they're more hooking up in college than they are dating. The emotional connection there they don't want. They, they say things in the interviews like, um, hey, I've got to get myself ready to go out and have a job, and I've got to do my study, and I've got to do all these things. I don't have time to take on somebody else's problems. We're not leaving. <laughs> so that is a, a planned fire drill, and they've gotten permission for us to stay here. Um, so, in toto, when we look at these things we've talked about so far, the iGen teenagers are less likely to date. They're less likely to drive around with friends. They're less likely to go to movies. They're less likely to go to the mall or anywhere else to hang out with kids. They are, they are spending the bulk of their leisure time alone at home. And they're not playing board games with mom and dad during that time. This is alone at home. If they feel lonely and isolated, it's because they are. 
And the world that they're living in online doesn't make up for that. In fact, it exacerbates that, that feeling. Um, so, one of the, the most important thing about this book is that we, we get to see all the data. We get to see the, the questions and the comparisons between the generations, and we get to think about that for ourselves. But uh, Twenji also has interviewed all these iGen kids, and, um, and she draws some conclusions. And that's when I, when I started, and I said, she, it's like she's shouting at us. Hey, okay, wait a minute. Pay some attention here. This is worth figuring out. Uh, what are the consequences? to the six hours on the iPhone. And this, was, this big change isn't computer or internet related. That happened first. And there were some issues, but that was different. This is smartphone. This is computer in your pocket. This is the, you know, the ability to do whatever you want to do on this thing that you can hold and take with you everywhere. Right? OK, so. One might ask, in fact, I would ask, okay, a lot of teenagers, um, a lot of teenagers struggle with friendship. They are very uncomfortable with other teenagers. They are very aware that they're being judged constantly. They have what we call the um, uh, invisible audience. They believe deep in their core when they walk into a group that everybody's looking at them and that everybody's evaluating what they see. And they walk around all, this is for generations, they walk around all day thinking, oh my God, oh, they see this, oh, they don't like this, you know, they, oh, I did this, you know, all of these, all of these things. Um, so this, it's not like it's new to, uh, to not be able to connect. So I'm thinking, well, if kids can have these friendships online, isn't that better than no friendship at all? Or if, it, if, this is, if this is a safe space to build a community that a kid doesn't have at school or in the neighborhood or wherever, then isn't there something about that that might ameliorate some of the angst of normal teen years? Um, and uh, pretty much not. That, that proves to be pretty much not true. I'm sure there's a way that it is true. But uh, what the data shows is, is um, something that Twinji talks about a lot. So she says, okay, one way to answer that question is from the data that, that we've drawn on the question of happiness. Are you happy? Remember, these questions were all answered by the kids. They're, they're reporting this anonymously over the years to these questions. And so a simple question like, are you happy? Uh, so they know, and then the questions go on about, you know, what is it that, when are you happiest? What is the most happy thing you've done? You know, all these questions to un unwrap that a little bit. So it uh, turns out that there are certain activities that create joy slash happiness, right? And what we know from the data is that group of activities, I will call them protective factors because that would be a term that I've used, always used. And that it really helps parents, I think, kind of know a little more of this <laughs> will be, will protect from some of this that we can't get out of the world. Right? So the more times, the more time kids spend on non-screen activities, the more likely they are to be happy. And some of the activities that the kids are asked about that would fall in this category, these are the kinds of activities, if they're spending more time on these activities, then they tend to answer these happiness questions happier, right? So these activities are sports or exercise, uh, religious services, I'm going to talk about that a little bit, print media, reading, uh, in-person social interaction, Little, what's a little hard about that right now is the in-person social interaction with kids is with them with their phones in their hands, their eyes in the phone, but that's another thing. Um, homework even falls in that category. It's a lower one, but it, it's, it's one of those things when they're doing that, they're not as anxious and lonely and worried about what somebody else is thinking. They're engaged in it. That would be why the reading is a, is a thing that creates joy or happiness. What activities create misery? 
Uh, and misery is a strong word, and we're, you're going to understand why as we move forward here. The more time teens spend on screen activities, the less likely they are to report happiness. So TV is included in screen activities, but it's, you know, on any of the bar graphs, it's, you can hardly see it. But it's all of the other um, social networking kinds of, of media on the computer. The more time they spend there, the less happy they are. The less time they spend there, the happier they are. It's a clear uh, finding. And you probably already know it anyway from knowing about your teenagers. Um, what, what we might not know is how dangerous this unhappiness can be and what are the worst kinds of things that can happen that have to do with the social media world. So this risk of unhappiness is the greatest with the youngest teenagers. And that's, it's, it's, the author calls it a toxic mix. Toxic meaning poisonous, meaning leading to death. Right? That's, it, that term has been used on purpose by her. But I feel like I need to say something about what young adolescence is um, so that it really makes a lot of sense why someone would use that kind of a, a word, linked to death kind of a word. I'm going to do a little, a little um, very fast and very generalized picture of what happens when you go through puberty. Uh, because this is happening whether you're involved in slow childhood or long adolescence or regular old thing. This still happens. You still go through puberty and your body still grows. And it grows in four ways. When At the onset of puberty, you grow physically. Now, that sounds normal. There is nothing normal about it. It is traumatic. It can be particularly traumatic for all kinds of reasons, some of which are these. What if everybody else grows and you don't? Okay. What if you're the last boy in the class to grow? Or what if you're the first girl in the class to go through puberty? And everybody's eyes are on you. You know, this... The things that happen as you grow get lots of attention from the world you're in. It's public. It's not private. But, but all kinds of other things are going Your bones grow before your muscles and tendons do. You hurt. You can't sit still. You can't get comfortable. You're likely to break a bone, more likely to break a bone in the two years after going through puberty than at any other time in your life. You're fragile. Your, your body's growing, and it grows weird. Your ears and your nose grow before your face. And you don't look like you, and you don't look that good. <laughs> and you look in the mirror, and that's the least of your problems if you have any kind of acne. Or if all of a sudden you need glasses and you never did before, which happens all the time at this stage. Um, you, if you're a girl, uh, the growth happens first with a layer of fat that is absolutely essential to the body creating your reproductive system. But we live in a world that doesn't like that. In fact, our mothers are pretty freaked out when this happens because they know how everybody else is going to treat you when all of a sudden you were just this active, kind of normal, average person running around with ease and with no problems. And now all of a sudden you've got 10 to 20 pounds added onto the same frame you had some of it is curves, and a lot of it is just fat. And it's not going to stay there forever. But when you're 12 or 13 or 14, what does that matter? And when your mother's sending you to school with carrot sticks instead of anything else to eat, and you're growing and you're starving, you know, what does that tell you about what your mom thinks about it? Or whenever your dad hugs you, you think he's trying to see if I'm fat. You know, what does that say about how insecure you are about what's happening in this physical growth. So the, you grow. And uh, for some kids, it's so fast. I mean, they, you know, parents say you grow overnight. They've measured kids who grow half an inch at night. And it's not you kind of grow overnight. You might put on six inches over the summer between seventh and eighth grade or eighth and ninth grade. Six inches. Uh, so it's not like oh, I'm growing. It's, the, it's a big deal growing, right? What happens to you in every way uh, during this post-puberty, the onset of puberty, 
is the most dramatic change in human beings except for 0 to 18 months. This is the next one. It's the last one, like this. So that is physical. The next thing that happens is intellectual. You have this brain. It's been working well. It's been organized. You know the rules. You tell people what to do. There's a right and wrong. You let them know where your mom's purse. I mean, you know things. You do things. You're pretty calm. You may have gone through some bumps early on, but it's kind of evened out. And then, boom, your brain goes like that. And that's exactly what it does. It blossoms. They call it blossoming. And as these hormones go through the body and your body gets the message, grow, 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 you send out millions of tendrils that are unattached in your brain. Of course, they're not this big. And what will happen over the next two to four years is these tendrils will begin to attach and make neural pathways. And they attach based on an experience. So, and it doesn't have to be you get... You become an expert. I learn how to blow the clarinet. Boom, 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 boom. I get these neural pathways. They are there forever. I may forget the clarinet. I've got better things to do and pick it up 10 years later, but I will be better able to master the clarinet than if I hadn't tooted on it when this was happening uh, before. So when middle schools want kids to do lots of different kinds of things, or when you as middle school parents want your kids to, you know, try a little of this and try a little of that, that's good brain growing stuff. The, the move in sports for kids specializing at such a young age, to me, feels a little bit counterproductive. I mean, I can understand gift, uh, working on gifts, but you really want lots of stuff going on with middle school kids, and you don't want them sitting around. Because this is the time when the brain gets kind of settled in, then the body sends out a, uh, a signal that, that says, get rid of the dead weight. And all this unattached stuff is pruned by the body and sucked up out in the blood and off it goes or wherever it goes. It's never coming back. The brain will grow and make new connections. But this is never happening again. This happened, but... That what's hard about this? I, I, Joan said I taught sixth, seventh grade. I have all these grades. Well, sixth and seventh graders think one way. You give me a class of eighth graders, it's like, wow, these kids can think and they're making all these connections and they're so excited. And here, here they're thinking, whoa, these people do that differently than my family, than I, than those. You know, all of a sudden there's this sort of aliveness. You can almost see this happening in the brain. But it also creates confusion. It was so well organized before. And there's no order here. And now all of a sudden, your mom and you had decided that it was wrong for you to do this. But now you've got 10 ideas about that. 10 other ways <laughs> that you might do that. So, you know, I mean, in, in most of the teenage parent dynamic, that would be, you know, there'd be a struggle here. I don't know for sure what happens today, but their brains are still going like that. It, it can be a confusing time, and it's definitely a time of great change for parents and kids. Uh, socially, all of it's like uh, from some kids, all of a sudden they wake up and see there are other people in the world. Oh, who knew that these people were people you could talk to or hang out with or get to know, and all of a sudden you're kind of interested. I mean, you might notice it more between boys and girls, but it actually happens, you know, across the board, this... All of a sudden, it's, it's important to have some more friends. Not easy to, but I seem to be getting a signal that I'm better off with a tribe than without one, right? So there's that thing happening. You're socially growing. Emotionally, you're growing. The hormones that invade the body with puberty, that's what I discuss a lot in the All About Boys and All About Girls book, and I won't say much here except that it creates a soup for emotional upheaval to begin with. So when you take that kid and you put a smartphone in their hand and someone takes a nude picture of them or someone begins to bully, bully them online or some, everybody ignores them or unfriends them or whatever might happen, you take that kid, the chance for trauma becomes very high. All of these tendrils that are connecting, one of the things that connects 
our experience, emotional experiences. So you get bullied, you lay down some neural pathways. And those neural pathways tell you when this starts to happen, you have reason for panic. You have reason to be concerned. And for the rest of your life, if those neural pathways get laid down, you're going to travel them when something goes wrong. Unless you can somehow, through counseling and all kinds of other things, learn how to, how to undo the effect of them and, and talk yourself out of it. So it's, so it's toxic in so many ways that um, for the young teens. Now, when kids get to high school, a lot of them will report, you know, that was middle school nonsense that we did on the phones. I mean, it used to be not on the phones, just middle school nonsense, but now heightened middle school nonsense. So we don't do that in high school anymore. In fact, that, that may be true that some of the early adolescent meanness and, you know, puppy or, or pack order kind of things going on, some of that may be dealt with. But they're still spending six hours on social media, so it's, it's not like they, they're still not learning their adult tasks that need to be checked off, right? So it's not like it's, but it's not as, as dangerous maybe emotionally for them unless, it, unless a certain kinds of thing happens. So, okay, now back to this. Teens who visit social media sites, social networking sites every day are more likely to feel lonely. They're more likely to feel left out. These pictures, spring break, you know, I stayed home and cleaned the basement with my mom, and these kids went to Paris and skiing and deep, deep sea fishing. And I mean, I've got to figure out some kind of picture that matches this, right? What am I going to put on that will mean I did something cool at spring break too? Um, so the, the, there's a little anxiety, one-upmanship kind of competition piece that's always going on. But you can feel like everybody else is having fun when someone posts pictures of friends. I'm not in it. Then what does that mean? Does that mean I had a party and didn't invite me? Does it mean uh, nobody likes me? You know, what does that mean? Where were they? Why wasn't I there? Um, and um, so, you know, the, the, these ripples can go on forever. It's one thing to feel lonely. It's one thing to feel left out. Um, and it's one thing to want more good friends. Most of us go through our life looking for good friends. Good friends are gifts. We, we, we need them. Um, and in fact, if you have those things in your teen years, you might make it out in pretty good shape. Uh, it's going to be harder if you don't. If you have your family, you can always count on them. But if you don't have some kind of other network. It can be one person, by the way. It doesn't have to be the group. It has to be a friend to learn some of this and to feel this support. Um, but if you don't have that and you think everybody else does, that's one thing. That's, I'm lonely. I'm left out. You might have felt that way in 1980 without social media. But what we're seeing that really ramps things up a bit is they're actually six classic symptoms or symptoms of classic depression, clinical depression, depression that is a, a medical emergency, right? And from those six, many of those symptoms are, are things that are reported by teenagers on social media who, who, are, who use their social media every day. And that includes this increasing sense of hopelessness, it includes a lack of meaning. What is this all about? You know, this is just too hard. What is life? Is this what life is about? Uh, you know, where do I get off? Kind of, oh my goodness, who, who wants this? And um, loss of interest in life. Those three things in particular get lots of marks in the survey questions by kids who are using the most social media. And those are not just teenage angst. Those are not just normal growing pains. Those are a bigger deal. Um, we know that eighth graders who are heavy users of social media increase their risk of depression, not, not unhappiness, depression, by 27%, while those who 
play sports, go to religious services, or even do their homework cut the risk significantly? Protective factors versus things that can be negative factors. At the very least, we know that much time on social networking does not spark joy, interest in life, as opposed to loss of interest in life, a sense of purpose, as opposed to no, what is the meaning of life, I don't get one, um, and, and hopefulness instead of hopelessness. Uh, hope is one of the main things you need to hold out to teenagers every day. You're not always going to be a teenager. I know you don't have good friends yet, but believe me, those soulmates are coming. They're out there somewhere looking for you. You just haven't found each other yet. Uh, that, that hope piece. Um, at the very, um, also, teens who spend three hours plus are 35% more likely to have at least one suicide risk factor and a higher risk for suicide. That's a third of them. Uh, and almost all of them spend three hours. Three hours plus, maybe not. But three hours isn't six hours, right? One of the main things that people who are looking at this keep saying is, use it less, use it less, use it less. Don't throw it in the trash can, which is what you all want to do now. But use it less. Don't, you know, guide it. Uh, not because the, the data says... A bunch of it creates these really horrible consequences. Um, one of the things that makes this true is because cyberbullying is even more pernicious than on-site bullying uh, because the audience is so huge and because it's there forever. One of the most sad things is, it, it's very common things, is when something bad happens online to teens, and there's some really, really bad things that happen among really great kids in really good places. I mean, kids have always, this has always been true, and there's a whole bunch of, of times in life when kids feel more like a wolf pack than they do like human beings. Uh, I mean, group mentality is, a, is hard, right? So in cyberbullying, and when things happen to teens, their first instinct is to hide it from mom and dad. For all kinds of reasons, but the main one is they don't want their parents to think badly of it. They don't want their parents to think nobody likes me. They don't want their parents to worry. They don't want their parents to think, well, what did you do to these people that they're saying these things and doing these things to you? They don't want their parents to go to the school or go to the parents because they know it's going to get worse before it gets better. And it's about as bad as they want it to be, right? And they are often filled with shame. Instead of feeling like, what? This isn't right. You know, this sort of righteous indignation of, what are you doing? I'm going to get to school and I'm going to deal with this right now with you today. Hey, what happened here, buddy? You take this down. Because when you feel shame or when you're worried that making a big deal of it will mushroom it, what you do is you just sink in. And you teach yourself to sink in. You teach yourself when trouble comes, that might be the difference between growing up with this kind of value of you're going to be tough and you're going to be strong. Take care of yourself. The dog bites, don't go in front of the dog. You know, if this friend is bad, He's not your friend. Leave him alone. Get, get away from him. Just do it, you know. That just do it piece doesn't feel like you can even, it's impossible when you are in this, this thing. Now, think about this, this picture, because I know this picture is a real one. Your child, your teenage child who is smart and capable and loving and has amazing potential and is on a path, where you feel like life is going to be okay, it's going to man, it's going to be manageable, it's going to be good. Goes to bed at night, cell phone plugged in by the bed. Throughout the night, wakes up, checks messages, to see and see what's, what whatever else is doing. Goes back to sleep. Wakes up at two in the morning, and some really awful thing has been posted on a huge site about her or him. It's the middle of the night. No going back, it's there. 
you got to go out and face the world or stay in your bed for the rest of your life. And, and nobody's in the room with you. What happens next? The, the idea that kids would have this in the bedroom, right? Would, would have this portal to trouble, this, 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 it's, yeah, this great thing that can do marvelous stuff that you don't need to do in the middle of the night, by the way. To have it there and, and see it in the most vulnerable moment leads to all kinds of bad decision making, if nothing more than just thinking, my life is over. Yeah, my life at that school is over. Guess what? Kids at other schools have iPhones too. You know, it's not like you leave this school when that happens and go to some other school where they don't know it. You can't even go to some other state where they don't know it or might not. I mean, then they know. The teenager knows that. Um, so just like we feel safe, with, with the iPhone in our kids' pocket, because that means they have access to us, we don't feel worried with the iPhone in their bedroom uh, away from us. That's what we should be worried about, and not this, right? I mean, we, we, we don't know. We didn't, how would you know? How can we think these nice kids that we've known since they were three years old would do these bad things? Especially if we've never had a teenager before. Um, I feel compelled to throw this in because I, I, it's, it, it's not related, but I think it's sort of an important tangent. Uh, one of the things that I learned as a parent that I didn't see so well as a teacher or living with teenagers forever um, was that you have to be careful how many people you cross off the list as bad kids because... I'm telling you, they end up being the ones that rescue your kid in the, in the moment they need it the most. And, and, you know, here you are not just thinking badly of this kid, but sharing bad things about this kid and banning this kid from, you know, existence. Um, so you really have to be kind of as hard as it is. There's this place where the boomer parents had it right. These kids out there running around wild in the neighborhood, they're our kids. You're not my kid. You're part of all of us, right? And when he does something wrong to you, I don't like it. But when you do something wrong to him, I don't like that either. Work it out. You know, let's figure this out. Let's learn how to live together. That's what adults do. They've learned how to live together, supposedly. Um, so the in cyberbullying... There's definitely things that go wrong that are just vicious, that need to be addressed. There is no question about that. They wouldn't have, if they wouldn't have happened without that phone. What does that say to us? If it wouldn't have happened face to face, if it wouldn't have happened in the hallway where other kids could intervene, or where you could walk away, or where you could stand up for yourself, if, if somehow it's it's a horrible, vicious thing. And it's a horrible, vicious thing made possible by this ability to go public with your worst instincts right? and to hurt someone that much. So the, a, a big reason why these effects come from social media use has to do with cyberbullying, but not all of it. I mean, a third of the kids will be bullied uh, in 2016. That's a lot compared to times past. But that means two-thirds of them aren't. So there certainly might be kids online who are not neither cause, causing trouble or having trouble done to them. But you just never know in the fickleness of youth who might be next or who might get bored tonight, which is often what it is. Who was awake and bored tonight and did something tonight they would never do in the light of day? Most of our misbehavior in, in our lives is done at night and regretted when the sun comes up, right? Well, they have a really interesting vehicle to cause that to happen. There were 46% more male suicides in 2015 than in 2007. That is eight years. This cultural change was dramatic and fast. Um, we often talk about teenage boy 
suicide, uh, which is one of the um, most horrible um, aspects of living with growing up people, um, is that it's incidental. Something bad happened today, and if I make it through tonight, I'll be okay. Uh, I don't think that that is probably still true. I'm sure that there are those. But I think that this, this growing angst with boys and girls who are teens sort of stays with them over a long period of time would be more the typical kind of adults of suicide, which is I've, I've tried, I just can't handle it. You know, I keep getting evidence. Uh, sometimes really, really sad kids move from school to school, but then they have the same experience and talk about hopeless. You know, it's one thing to not be liked here. It's a whole other thing if I'm not liked anywhere I go. There's no place where I can be happy in the world, that kind of thing, right? So uh, depression, this teenage angst is not depression. Depression and suicidal thoughts are life-threatening situations that must be handled medically. They, they, you know, you need counselors, you need medicine, you need the things that doctors might decide you need to help. Even so, even though those are possibilities in the world, teenagers are killing themselves in it twice as often as they did 10 years ago. Uh, if you or your teenager resists counseling, let me just say this about it. Don't. It's as if you, you know, broke your leg and you didn't get a cast, uh, only it's life-threatening. It's not, you know, whether you're going to live for the rest of your life. Uh, it, t teenagers will always say, no, I won't go, and then you take them, and then they like it. Maybe. You know, it may take one or two different counselors to click, but here's what they find when they get there. Here's a human being that will look them in the eye and talk to them. Here's a human being who will understand what they're feeling. Here's a human being who will teach them coping skills that will begin to help them get this strength to stand upright and go into the world and decide, I'm going to be happy. And decide there's something good here, there's hope. These skills last a lifetime, by the way. But you don't have to be with a counselor a lifetime to get those. So the... Um, when we're talking about a mental health epidemic of depression and suicide, people need to really consider getting help as soon as possible, the best help as possible, and keep looking until it is the right help. Uh, and don't give up on it. And make your kid do it. Evidently, these kids don't rebel, so <laughs> evidently they'll go with you. Uh, and if they don't, carry them. Um, so th this... Um, this is all sad stuff, right? It's heavy. It's actually, it's horrifying. Our whole job is to get these kids from birth to adulthood. And to think somebody else has come in, some other force outside our family and outside our schools and outside our, has come in and messed things up for them is shocking. There, there must be, you know, some solutions here. The next part, the mental health crisis part, is just um, more data on these subjects. Um, I, I would say a couple of things from this page, but I'm not going to go through the whole time, through the whole thing. The uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, that drives kids to their phone every five minutes, if not always having it right there. Um, it's, a, it, it's not like schizophrenia. It's made up. It, it's made up by this culture as some important thing that is plaguing me as a human being. Um, and, and, and so if you find out you're missing out, what happens? You get depressed. What good is that? Better not to know, by the way, that you're missing out than to know. Uh, and so I'm pretty sure any time you go online, you're going to find out you're missing out. Somebody somewhere is doing something. You're sitting at home on your bed, right? Uh, so that's sort of a, if you hear that term, uh, that's what that means. So after we look through what's slow childhood, which just isn't 
it's like childhood, which is what it is, and the effects of um, a lot of screen time, and the effects of not a lot of the protective factors that we know help kids grow, then um, can we pinpoint the cause? So she writes this book. There's five chapters of the book I haven't even talked about that I'll, I'll mention in a two-minute thing that are fascinating, but not as much to the point as I could do in two hours, but you may want to read those. Um, so this is what she knows for sure that she tells that she shouts to us the loudest. These are the three most important things to know. More screen time led directly to unhappiness and depression. Less in person in person social interaction led to unhappiness and depression. More screen time led to less print media use which led to unhappiness and depression. Those are the three findings that are the most dramatic, and most solid if you examine the data. Also important, but not in the top three. And this goes back to that, you know, if you're raised wanting to be safe or you're raised forced to be tough, how do you look different? Well, the, the wanting to be safe kids who are the iGen kids, we know to one degree or another on this continuum, are not prepared for adolescence. And adolescence is what they get on their phones. They have no tools to deal with it, right? And they're not getting the practice to deal with it. And they're not living in other worlds to understand that there are other worlds. This isn't the only world that we're in. Um, it, it's, uh, it's cultural. It's parental. Uh, one author calls it fearful parenting, or the, the old-fashioned term is helicopter parenting. Um, but it's all of it together. It's not one of those pieces. It, knowing that, though, gives us some clues about how to, what, what to tweak or what to deal with. And the other thing to uh, consider is if your kids have any, any devices in their beds, bedrooms at night, they're awake all night. And there's just no way around it they are off and on awake all night checking things. And what they're checking makes them nervous, anxious, and unable to sleep. So teenagers who need the most sleep for these four reasons that we talked about um, uh, are getting the least sleep, and it's not because of what time school starts. It's because of what happens during the night. I mean, school can start later and help, but they're still, they're still not sleeping. They need nine hours. Some kids need more at that age because think what's happening to them physically and all of these things. But they're getting less than seven hours average. That means some kids are getting five, four. Um, and that is a contributing factor to the depression and unhappiness and unhealthiness in every way. Uh, there's a few other things that the book talks about that I feel like are worth mentioning, but I don't have time to go into. But if, if you're interested, if this piques an interest because of your family or your situation, uh, I've put some, some pages in the book that lead to the graphs and the, the, where it's talked about. Uh, one of the protective factors that is racing out the door for American teens is religious affiliation. It is, is some kind of a faith and practice of faith that the family does. Um, the reason that's, it's a protective factor at, at all ages, but the reason that's a particular protective factor for teenagers, uh, one in three iGeners do say they do not believe in God and they will not go to any organized religion. And part of that has to do with their sense of fairness to include, you know, it's the LGBT inclusion, the, the racial inclusion, the religious inclusion. These kids want this. Inclusion. They don't get why God would like, you know, some people and not the rest of them. So that's part of it. But most of that comes from a family uh, practice. It's, it's not just uh, the, the generation itself that has come to this place. That's a lot. Uh, in the 1970s, 85 to 92 percent of, of teenagers were involved in some kind of religious affiliation practice. Now, why is that important? Okay, when you think about this explosion of who, who, of who I'm becoming, this growing thing, one of the wake-up pieces that happens is spiritual. 
it's, it's not by accident that almost all religions have a coming of age um, claiming of the soul, the spirit of the human being, you know, whether it's a, a confirmation or a baptism or a, a, you know, a, all the other things that my brain's not even saying. Everybody has these because kids wake up to it. And in the, the existential issues of adolescence, this is huge, by the way, and when it's not resolved in adolescence, it's coming back up. We don't stay humans without resolving some of these issues. But if you want to know where midlife crisis comes from, it comes from unresolved issues in adolescence. If you want to know where inability to, uh, to become independent in adolescence comes from, you better look at your two-year, what, what happened when he was two. Did he learn that, you, that he wasn't mom? That he was somebody separate, right? They all come back. They keep coming back. Well, this existential crisis of adolescence says this. There's the piece that says, who am I? It's my body. Uh, who am I? This brain. Who am I? Do people like me? Who am I? Who what are these feelings? There's these who am I things that you kind of have to work with for years to figure this out. And then you go to the who am I potentially? You know, what can I dream? What can I practice? What can I do? How can I get here? You know, what do I want? And then you get to purpose. And when you get to purpose, am I more than me? This is the existential question, right? And if I'm just me and I'm not that happy with me, so, you know, why live? This question of purpose actually turns out to be, in one way or another, a religious question. And so kids who are affiliated, that's tended to. They go to, you know, Young Life or, or camp with uh, uh, the other Jewish kids, or they go to Kinnikuk, or they go, and they go places. They go to youth groups. They go to uh, groups of kids with leaders who understand these questions, who, who accept these kids who accept um, their questions. I remember, I remember this time in my own life very well, and we are all so different. But the thing I remember about it was when I questioned the beliefs that my family had and that my group had and that this church I was affiliated had, I never questioned it. I really bought in. But I certainly questioned why I didn't seem to believe as deeply as some other people or have the same kind of experience as some other people are having. And I'm thinking, why not? You know, what's, the, what's the deal? And that, when I questioned that, I, I never felt like anybody got me. What I was questioning was this existential question, should I be here? And if I should, what should I be doing? You know, what is this life about? If it's just about me, it's not going to take me as far. So it's not unusual to, uh, to realize that a lack of some dealing with these kinds of philosophical, religious questions at the, in the teenage years leave that door unopened of purpose. Purpose gets you through a lot in life. Nothing else matters when your purpose is intact, right? You can do it. Okay. The other things that, that they talk about in the book are the way I Jenners are going to college and picking majors and picking jobs. And they have, they, it's, it's really interesting that, that as a group they feel it's not really about their passions, it's about how they get a good job. So, you know, I really love to draw, but accountants get hired every day, right? They never get fired. You need more of them, you don't need less, you know? Um, so, it, it's decisions being made for work. Uh, relationships. I may go out or hook up with somebody at a bar, but I don't have time for the boyfriend-girlfriend, the girlfriend-girl, whatever the thing is. I don't have time for that drama. I'm on this path. I am doing this. Um, my kids waited a while to get married. Kids today do that. But I can remember thinking, you know, so much of their decisions, of, so many of their decisions about life were made before they even decided to go through it with somebody else. You know, my husband and I made them together. God help us, but we did. But uh, we didn't make them separately. And so I, I wondered, you know, so in that generation, that 
whatever that generation was called before millennials, and millennials, they were waiting. But these kids are going to wait longer. And they may not even choose it. They aren't forming intimate relationships. They aren't even forming real deep friendship relationships. So that's, that's another part of the book that's out there. Uh, politically, everybody thought, you know, it's getting more and more liberal, and the millennials are more and more liberal, and these kids aren't. Uh, and they're not also political as in Republican or Democrat. They have very, uh, they, they are, the book even says this, I didn't make this up, that in so many of the things, the ways they answer questions, they end up as libertarians. It, it goes to this uh, individual kind of concentration that they've had and this, hey, I'm going to do this, do what you want. You do you, I'll do me, we'll all be happy. You know, but I don't, don't, I'm not going to tell you to take that gun out of your purse and you don't tell me, you know, what I should think about something kind of thing. Interesting. Not what we expect, nothing in IGEN is what we expect if we look at this information. The uh, good parts, safe drivers, fewer tickets, fewer accidents, but they don't, all that. They're not risk takers. They're safety hoarders. They don't take chances. They don't get in fist fights. I mean, I know this is a good thing. It's a different thing, though, for teenage boys. Let me just say that. The incidence of rape has been cut in half from 1992 to 2015. Again, we look at this safety thing. Girls are taking care of themselves, you know, and they are not putting themselves in. They're afraid to. And the result is they aren't there. So that is all true. The thing that it leads to is I mean, we kind of thought we're doing all these innovative things in, in, uh, in um, schools and we know the world, the technological world is really moving to a place where we really need creative people and engineer people and visionary people and visual arts. That we need all that. And the kids are kind of coming away from that to something different. We thought we'd have lots of entrepreneurs. Certainly in Wichita, Kansas, we think that. That requires risk-taking, right? That requires a kind of a putting out your passion in front of your, of your, stable, your stable job that you know you're going to get the income for. Um, and they tending to be quite uninterested, in fact, in things like entrepreneurship. We didn't think that was going to be the case. When we actually thought we were preparing them differently than that. Um, but isn't there a value now that we're thinking about an 18-year-old? We're not thinking about a 10-year-old anymore. Now that we're thinking about an 18-year-old, isn't there a value in them having learned to take risks, to take chances, to put themselves out there, to stand up for themselves, to listen to other ideas and not be hurt by them, to see an, in, uh, you know, there was an example of the swastika on the school wall that somebody had painted overnight, and the parents uh, all decided that their kids weren't safe to go to school that day, so they kept all their, their kids home. You know, by 7 o'clock, the swastika was gone, uh, and nobody was there doing something. They didn't know who painted it. You know, my guess always is teenage boy, but maybe not these teenage boys. But, um, but I mean, th th this, this, you know, sometimes we can show up anyway. You know, we, we can be in our life and do it. And so I worry um, for them in this slow childhood that they haven't had a chance to practice some of this, these other things that life's going to require it. You may not need, as a child, to be a risk taker. But if you're not going to be a child forever, you may not need, as a child, to be strong on your own. But if you're not going to be a child forever, I can promise you, and you know it too, they're going to need to be strong. Not maybe every day, but they're going to be days. When their own well-being and the well-being of everybody they love depends on them being strong and not being afraid. So that's what I, Jen, this book, is talking to us about. The suggestions are all things you've heard before. I've listed them. They're the last chapter of the book, but there is nothing here that you haven't already thought about sitting here today. Put off giving a child a cell phone as long as possible. 
They don't need one in lower school or elementary school. Um, they don't. I'm not saying they don't have them, but why would you want them to? That's the question. But put it off as long as possible. Once you've given them one, that horse has left the barn. Um, they, she suggests that if you're going to give phones to middle school students, she, she just says she, she doesn't really abide by, I certainly don't, this idea that my kid needs a, a cell phone at least in his bag if he leaves the house. She doesn't really buy that, but she said, if you're going to do that, if you can't let him ride a bus without you being handy or whatever, get him a dumb phone. You know, you don't have to get him a smartphone. The whole world is coming in his, in, into his pocket. Um, he says, that as they begin to use social networking uh, and the Internet, have that happen on your home computer where you can see it and where you can control it. If you hand them a smartphone, put the controls on first before they change the password or before they create other accounts uh, and check it often. And if the password gets changed, you know, the phone is yours. Take it away um, because that means they're doing something that is going to cause them harm and they very well are doing something that's causing everybody else harm too because uh, not just two kids are doing that. Lots of kids are doing that. Um, the less time on, the better. So moderation is what needs to be practiced. It's interesting that the tech giant kids in Silicon Valley send their kids to schools with no computers. Um, and, and Adam Alter in his book, Irresistible, had this quote that I had to write down. Um, it seemed as if people producing tech products were following the cardinal rule of drug dealing, never get high on your own supply. <laughs> I'll say this about siblings. Um, because the cell phones are at home, siblings aren't interacting either. either. Now, sometimes that's a good thing, right, because there's no fighting. But sibling interaction, fighting, disagreeing, not wanting to share, sometimes having fun, that whole thing, sometimes that's just better not having it, except it's not. Because you can count on siblings to be the sandpaper for each other that the rest of us appreciate. You know, your brother will tell you to quit picking your nose. You know, your sister will tell you, no, that shirt doesn't match your pants. You don't have to go to school and get humiliated and outcast because you figured that out from your sibling. Your sibling's going to tell you, stay away from those kids. You know, why did you do that? I heard you. Well, what's wrong with you? And your mom's not. Your mom's not there. Your mom doesn't know the dynamics. And your mom looks at you and sees gold. She doesn't see a pink shirt and, you know, orange pants. Um, so when they're not interacting, you're losing more than a chance to get to know your sibling and time spent in face-to-face -face social interaction. You're losing the sibling piece that is, is why siblings even matter. Um, I, it's been interesting coming back. I've been off campus for four years, and so I've been coming back to pick my grandson up at school. So I'm seeing there what I see everywhere else I go. Uh, kids are playing on the playground, and there's moms, uh, but they're on their phone. They're not talking to each other, and they're not watching what the kids are doing. Um, or in the early chat, and not everybody. I'm just using this as an example to make a point. Uh, in the hallway, when they're sitting on the benches in early childhood before the kids are, are dismissed, and some of the they may have another baby or a two-year-old with them, or and they're on the phone. Um, everywhere you go. The adults are on the phone. Everywhere you go, the adults' face is here. It's not eye-to-eye -eye contact. Somebody may jog me into it, right? I don't think we can expect anything less of our kids. I mean, that, their job is to mimic us. You know, we may not be putting nude pictures on the Internet, but we're in the phone, right? So if you're going to make changes at home, I would say one of the most important ones is that you don't have a phone with you either. If you, I mean, do it when you're not at home or when they're in bed or, or in the designated phone break that you're going to take every 45 minutes. Okay, check your phone. You get five minutes, uh, whatever you do with that. Um, there's cool stuff you can do with it. You can do all of that cool stuff with a computer too, but nonetheless... And you can teach your kids these two things. They will think you're stupid for saying it, but it might stick in their heads. Do not share nude pictures on your phone. It's not your boyfriend. Do not 
hold your look at your phone when you're talking to your friends. Your phone's not your friend. And those two rules may help to begin to open up a conversation about this is ruining your life. It isn't in toto ruining your life, but some things about this are ruining your life. Uh, the talk about pornography is for another day, and it will come up in uh, boy and girl classes. But let me just say it has changed sexual behavior between kids to be uh, in a very negative way, to, to, to be not in, one of intimacy and love, not one of tenderness and passion, and in some cases not even possible because the place for sexual pleasure for me is on the computer. So, I mean, talk about horrible things. That's the, another one. That's not for today. Um, I'll say one more thing, then, and then it will be time to go, but I'm happy to stay and answer questions. Um, next Friday, I'm doing the day-long workshop called Expanding the Playpen. And what that workshop is is seven topics of things that grow lives of teenagers instead of hurt lives of teenagers, right? The kinds of experiences, kinds of, of activities and so forth. It, it's a thing where there's a lot of storytelling and then you have a chance to plan or think about what you'd like to do with the teenagers in your life. Write it down. Uh, talk about it. Give it some thought. Um, I've always said that this is going to be a book someday, but I've never pulled the trigger. But after reading this book, I am going to do that. And I'm good. So if you want to have some examples of yours in the book, you come <laughs> next Friday and I'll put some of your stories in and whatever name you want, Sally. Um, because I, I'm really feeling how that this is even more important than it was as when I first started talking about it. Um, so I was really didn't want to come today because I think this is so depressing. <laughs> But I'm interested to know if you have any questions or comments that um, you don't mind asking, even though many of you are going to have to leave. Yes? Well, there's, you know, every coin has two sides, right? So I totally get that. When I say keep them busy, though, just think of a protective factors list. It doesn't have to be the sport that you've got to take them to, sit there, bring them back when you take the other guy. It doesn't have to be that. This works best when the things are at school and you just pick them up later because they go right to a practice or a camp or a, you know, class or whatever. But... There are other protective factors that don't involve that. I mean, they, you can, um, they can exercise by riding their bike, right? They can read a book. They can get their homework done at a decent time so that when the family comes in, you can do something together as a family. They can do other things on that list of protective factors besides screen time. Um, and that's really the issue. I'm talking about less screen time and more activities that that we know cause happiness. Now, I will say this about, you know, dance class reminded me, not directly about dance class. Since they're having trouble making friends and being in social interaction avenues, because when they're out of school, they've got their phones, right? Then they are with friends in some of those organized activities without their phones, working together under adult supervision, whether it's loose or tight, uh, and that might be the only real social interaction they're getting. That would be the same of youth groups or of you know, other kinds of things. They aren't, use, they aren't on their phone, and they're getting the in-person social interaction, too, that is one of the three things. So obviously, with, with kids spread out, that becomes an issue how you do that, but, but I certainly would think about how do I limit screen time, up in-person um, time, and up reading? 
Don't go away depressed. Go away with a plan. I've got, I'm getting, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna get a plan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about it and move forward. Well, I think they are, but I think that that, that that could be turned in. It certainly is intended to be a positive kind of validation. It could be turned into that by a parent, too. Um, have you ever had this experience with your child when, where they tell a joke and you don't laugh? and it's, Mom, laugh. I'm funny. Tell me I'm funny. You know, this, this kind of, it's not unusual for them to want a validation from even a parent. But I think the idea of validating each other's work is under the teacher's supervision, and it's not hidden from the adults, you know, it's part of, of what we're looking for, is, is being able to look at our friends and say something nice. Being able to look at our friends' work and say, this is interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Engage in a conversation online or otherwise about it. So it, it needs, obviously needs to be looked at and would be something to talk to the teacher about if that, in, in, in that case, if it worries you. But that would be a perfect example of how social media is not going away. So what's the good part of it? that we can use, and what's the part that's eating their hearts and souls? I want to reinforce your point, um, and this is pretty transparent and candid here, so I'm able to take feedback from many of my friends. But um, we started late taking the phone out of the room for my daughter, and it has been a struggle, and she does not have it. She does have to turn it in, I get up at 5 in the morning, so I know it's there. It's just, she loses it the next day, 24 hours or more, depending on the... Anyway. Another thing, something to connect. Bless you. It is amazing what happens at 5 a.m. when I hit just her screen. I'm not trying to helicopter and look at all her texts. There's a point when she's got to own up to what she's saying and how she's interacting with her friends. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 3.30, 3.45, 4. But, I mean, I cannot tell you, and it tells you who's snapping. All her friends that are snapping her all through the night. And I'm talking, there's a list of 25. And I'm thinking, all these kids are not sleeping, and they are worrying. <laughs> and, it makes, it just, and it makes me go, okay, my daughter was doing this. If I know it's not put away, I know she's on somebody else's phone. Or, you know, I mean, her yeah. is coming tomorrow. So anyway, it was one of those reality checks that I just went, I am not helping. And she thinks she can control it, and she can't. And she's 15, and she can't. But there's this FOMO thing. You know, things are going on at 2 a.m. I don't want to miss out on this, right? It's real, so I'm just validating yeah. what you're saying. With, you know, you know I think you almost have to... Give it to me. I want to know. <laughs> 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 you're like, right. Oh, Tell me. I had Susan, by the way, she was keeping her iPad over the phone. And I'm like, no. I've got to protect her sleep. I've got to get her to a better place. Where she you didn't let her eat sugar when she was one. You didn't let her watch TV when she was six months. I mean, there are things we insist on. They match our value system, right? And this one is a tough one, and we, if we insist on it, it will help them. I mean, they, they're not going to like it. Actually, that's the real teenage experience, is having your parents do something you don't like. So that's the, all the better, right? <laughs> yes.
Right. I think that statement is part of the problem. This generation of kids, and, and believe me, if anything happened in Wichita, Kansas tomorrow, I, you know, I'd be horrified as everyone else. Uh, and I mean, it's unfathomable, right? This generation of kids, this, they're the safest children the world has ever known. Anywhere in the world, any time, these kids are safer than anybody else has been. They're safer than our kids in Wichita, Kansas were 15 years ago uh, from what happened at parties and in cars and on drugs and, you know, all this drinking. They're safe. Has the world changed yet? But it still remains true today that our kids are in more danger in their neighborhoods and in their homes than they are in a school. Could there be a school shooting at any time, anywhere? Evidently. And I think part of the reason might be some of these aggressive, unhappy, anxiety-ridden, untreated cases of people who are influenced by this kind of world. But we have to be ready. But when we create this sense it could happen here any day, any time, our kids get depressed. They get anxious. They get stressed out. And first, and you know what? It's true and it's not true. It's not true. I mean, I've, the whole generation of kids here, the 80s and 90s, grew up when BTK was killing people in Wichita. Those kids came home and checked under the beds and looked at for 20 years. Everybody locked their doors. All these things happened. There's a reason, but none of those kids got killed. So the anxiety of it goes with them. It goes with them in the brain. It goes with them in the choices they do and don't make. We just have to figure out as parents how to make them feel safe without making them feel fear. Maybe that's... And is that tricky? You bet. Mm -hmm. Yes. I agree. And, and whenever someone's shot anywhere now, it's national news. And, um, you know, we live in Kansas. This was the Wild West. There were, you know, there were people shooting people in Kansas before any of us showed up. And today, we're safe. We're safer. Is, is anyone who's alive, say we can't guarantee safety for any of us. When we walk out the door, but, but we, we are building kids... Um, power to to take care of themselves in however they can. And uh, and that doesn't happen out of fear. That happens out of, okay, a, a call to arms. When I was little, the kind of stories that were in um, our readers, I don't know today if, these, if this is even still true. They were always stories about, you know, the, the pioneer kid who, uh, who's 10 years old and he has to ride on his horse through the the invaders who are coming after the farm and find his dad and get him home in time to save mom and the girls. Uh, there were all these kid take action. Kid do something besides cower, you know, besides wonder. I don't even mean cower, besides worry and wonder. Kids, kids action. Um, one thing you can teach your kids that, that will help with this is is, is just this simple idea that the between something happening and you responding, Johnny said something mean, I hit him in the face. That took care of that, right? Between Johnny hit me and what I did, there's about 100 things that you can do. It takes a moment to decide what to do about Johnny hitting me in the face or Sally calling me fat or Mary posting an ugly picture of me or... There are other choices, most of which have nothing to do with hitting him back, uh, but are probably more effective. It's certainly just as effective. Why, why become Johnny when you're trying to tell Johnny he's wrong, right? Just that exercise. Well, it started when they were two and much Daniel Tiger, and he says, when you get up, say, you know, take a deep breath and count to four. One, two, three. 
Okay, all right, now I can do it, right? It's that constant practice of doing that that makes you feel like, okay, I've got some decisions to make. Not I'm a victim. I have some decisions to make about what I'm going to do. You may be an idiot and be mean to me all the time. You know what? That's your decision. My decision is I don't care. I have friends. I have family. I have things I want to get doing. I don't care. Right? That's a hard one these days. You've got to learn it. You've got to practice it as much as you've got to practice managing money. So that's a dilemma. There's no question. But, but be, know this. In reality, these are the safest kids there have ever been. You've got a whole bunch of people who never let the kids ride a bike around this block. And who never let them walk to the store or walk to school or walk anywhere. We have a lot of kids who never left their mother's side. When we do in the expanding playpen, we talk about what they didn't learn when they were standing by mom and what they needed to learn to be adults. Right? So that's what that's all about. But like, we can do this. It's just, it, as p other parents haven't lived during this time, but it does have a lot to do with the news. It, it's, it seems like it happens every day, everywhere, and it doesn't. It's a great big country, and there are some crazy people out there. But... Um, not happening here right this minute, probably not. How do you recommend balancing the So I recommend, get over it, <laughs> I recommend in the definition of parent, um, it, it is nice to be able to trust your kids and you trust them until you can't trust them. But the fact is that kids left to their own devices with other kids who may have no supervision or, or, or value structure or whatever uh, are, are very likely not just to get hurt but to hurt. Now think about the damage that that does too, right? I mean, um, the, the big example would be, you know, if I'm a kid and my parents say, they take the keys away if they ever sit here that I'm driving and I've been drinking, yeah, they will. And that's, you know, as they should take everything away, the, the car should disappear. But it's not just about you. What could have happened when you were doing that to somebody else in their family, right? This, I can't trust you, is, is as a parent, I know that you're living in a complicated world, going through a complicated time, and believe me, you need me, whether you know it or not, and God gave me to you, and I'm going to do my job. And it's not because I don't love you and trust you. You know, there are things that I didn't lie to my kids about that I never told them. None of their business, right? But I don't feel that, yeah, I don't want to know everything. I didn't want to know the song that my daughter was going to dance to in the thing until I figured out I, wouldn't have, I would have chosen another one. But I want to know. I, it's the tip of the iceberg thing. You have to say, I really believe this for parents, but especially parents of teenagers, I don't actually know how this affects IGN teenagers, by the way. In other generations, kids have lived in a parallel universe. They and their friends have a world that parents aren't invited into. This can be whether it's online or not, by the way. But this is true. When something happens big enough that you find out, you need to think about that as the tip of the iceberg. It just poked its head out. It's not an anomaly. It's you didn't know these things are going on, and it's going on. And if you don't deal with it when you hear about it, you're not taking care of them. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, one of our sons in the eighth, at the end of eighth grade um, was on the phone, made plans with his friends to go out driving. They were 14. And he was going to pick them up in our car. But the phone call was overheard, and so we were able to act. The other kids were 
parents didn't think it was a big deal, but personally, I thought that was a big deal. My husband actually really thought it was a big deal. Our son couldn't drive. The vehicle he was going to take was the only one we had. And it was going to be full of six of his best friends who were going to be riding with him, and he couldn't drive, and it was night. Now, do I think that's the only time he made a plan like that? No. Thank God, though, we figured out that he planned things like that and that he wasn't the angel we thought he was because we were able to get him out of it alive. We were able to get some of those friends out of it alive, right? And that's the job. And sometimes it requires looking at their things and, you know, finding the pot in the drawer and knowing things that they don't want you to know for their own good so that you can do your job. So that's why I say get over it. And it's not very friendly, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, that's right. There's so, the, 2012 is the last birth date of iGeners, but they are now all school age. They were born in those years. I think, I, I think they'll actually extend it because I don't think this period is going away yet. Yeah. The, now, the... Uh, the, da the, the data that they talk about goes up through 2016. The book was published in 2017. Yeah. Think of that. You know what that says to me besides smart kid? <laughs> we love that. Is... Um, how we, we tend to underestimate sometimes what, what kids can do. And, and it's so, when we're not busy looking somewhere else, we see them doing something that tells us who they are and that helps us guide them to become and to blossom in, in these directions. Um, that's fascinating. So, he's, so there's genetic and then there's watch modeling. Yeah. And, and wanting to look on here is modeling too, right? I, I just know the word. I have never seen a game of Fortnite. Oh, a typical game, yes. <laughs> Kill a nun, get more points. I know those games. Mm -hmm. So so I think somebody needs to know that's happening so they can block that. Definitely block that. Um, the world we live in 
uh, is one of technology. The, uh, the engagement of kids on their computers with homework and with schoolwork is greater on the computer than it was on the paper. I mean, they're living in a new world. But it, it, there does need to be a separation between homework on the screen and leisure time on the screen. And in fact, all of the things she's talked about, she's been careful to sort out. That six hours of leisure time, that doesn't even include homework and research and other things. But yes, so, so since it's homework, if there's not a way to block the things that aren't homework, then it's like we used to do in the old days is sit at the kitchen table, kids, and do your homework while I'm doing dinner so that I can see that you're not on the phone or you're not, you know, drawing pictures. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, you're doing your homework. That requires care. And that's a big... It'd be so nice to just say, oh, honey, go do it. Yeah. Well, you have been very patient. Yes. I've decided to be sorry now, yes. And are you tired of it? Okay, so there's several words you said that are so important. Addiction, yes. Not only are they addicted to their devices, and that that addiction will cause, as addictions do, harm in their lives and to their loved ones over time. That, there's no question about that. And the other thing that you said that was so interesting is this conversation about taking the phone away. And when you do, then he thinks. It's a, it's a love and logic thing from, from the old days. And here's, here's what love and logic is. I love you enough that I'm going to make you do what's good for you to do. So here's the deal. Here are the rules for the phone. You break the rules. I take the phone. I decide when you get it back. You can earn it back, and it won't be in a half an hour. But I will never again talk to you about taking the phone because... My taking it then allows you some time to logically figure out how to be a better boy, right? I don't want to have this conversation every day. So when the phone goes, it goes for a while. And it's like when you're um, grounded in the old days. 
You know, you ground a teenager. My God, that means you've got him in the house with you. Um, <laughs> but somewhere around day three, they become nice kids, you know. And day four and five, they don't even care that they're grounded. They're having such a nice time at home. And, uh, but, but the conversation has to go. Once they know the rules, this isn't just phones. This is driving and getting a ticket. This is, you know, calling your sister names. This is slamming the door in my face. This is all kinds of things. Here's the deal. We don't do that in our house. When we do it, here's what happens. Then the door gets slammed. Then you do what you said you were going to do. And you don't talk about it. And I tell teachers this all the time. Don't talk about it. You never win an argument with a teenager. I mean, who has ever won an argument with a teenager? They love arguments. They live for it. They, you know, they're all budding attorneys. I mean, it, <laughs> so, my, so I think you're doing everything right, except I would say this. Let them know what's going to happen and that the happen isn't for 30 minutes. The happen is at least until the next day. And if you have to do that more than once or twice, it's for a week. And I'll tell you what. You do that to me. You argue with me and you cause me grief over what I've already told you to do anymore. And we'll see if you can have this phone. It will go off the plan for six months. But we're not going to have this conversation every single time you don't follow the rules. And um, it's just amazing how powerful that is. Because you don't yell, then they don't yell. And then they have more time to think, how do I need to keep this from ever happening again? She's always going to take this phone from me. Um, with, with teenagers, I didn't even bring this up, and, and I don't even know whether I'd ever bring these things up again, because this isn't an iGen thing, but with teenagers... In the argument, when they're trying to be in charge of their own life, that actually is their job, by the way, to be in charge, to learn how to be in charge of their own. They're struggling with you for that. When they get upset, there's one sure way to extend that, make them more upset for longer, and that's for you to get upset. Because they're always going to up, out upset you every time. You can't out upset them. The only way to de-escalate it is for you to get less upset and quieter. And they don't know what to do with it because there's nothing there. And so then you do more and then you eventually, your silence, your action, your following through with what the agreed upon plan has been, whether they liked it or not, it, it, there's nothing else to say. Right? It's, it's, it brings it down. This is actually true for other people you fight with too. This is true for spouses and, you know, the person on the phone who wants you to come do something. I mean, the more upset you get, the more upset they get. It doesn't, this is a life truth. This isn't a secret. And the less upset you get, the calmer you get, the more that they reflect that. So the calmly taking the phone and not talking about it, no matter what else is going on here, is very uh, strong action. It's not just the phone you want because he didn't follow the rules. It's the arguing you want to stop. That's it's both of those things. It works for other things too. That is perfect. I mean, when else should you be without a phone? For sure then, right? Or any electronics. And um, there are a few different pieces of information about which kids get the highest SAT scores, but one of them is the kids who have the highest SAT scores ate dinner with their family every night around the table. So there, there is something about that, examining the day, learning about each other, talking about tomorrow, the, that thing that is... I want one of those protective factors. And
Well, I said 1020, and here I've kept you half an hour late. Thank you so much for coming. I hope it's, don't go home sad. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. You could do these talks, please. You could do these talks. You know how to do it. That's right. Do it better. And things change, you know. Oh, they've have changed so much. All right. I'll see you. Yeah. I could just listen because you said next Friday you have that. It's called expanding the playpen, and it's all day. Oh, it's. I don't know where it's going to be. It'll depend on how many people sign up. Yeah, They'll decide. Um, I'm having a surgery. It's the, oh! Isn't it, it's the 20th? Is, it? is that what? It, yeah, yes. Yeah. Right. So there's no way it's, you could find this info somewhere else. You know what? They're filming these. Okay. So you can get a video. I don't know how, but I'll find out for you. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, and what, are you going to be okay? Is the surgery scary? It's like colonoscopy. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, just uncomfortable. Yeah, that's not even uncomfortable. It's just yucky. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have this senior now. I'm trying just last week. I tried to do the phone thing, and the, the reaction was so Oh, I'm clean. sure. And it's made it worse. So... It's, it's the toughest when they are oh, yeah. about yeah. 